Scotland's streets are full of tributes to Scots who have helped shape both Britain and a wider Europe. Thinkers, politicians, warriors. But now Scotland is torn between two identities that have never been in conflict before, its British self and its European one. Scotland can now no longer belong to both. This dilemma is brewing into an acute constitutional crisis. What effect will leaving the EU have on those whose livelihoods have been shaped by European membership for decades? What we do need to know, and we need to know fast, is where our future workforce is going to come from. And how will Scotland cope as Britain leaves the single market? 80% of all the food we sell out of Scotland into international markets goes to Europe. Europe is the ball game for our export story just now. Scotland didn't choose this. It rejected Brexit, but Brexit is being thrust upon it. What will that do to the 300-year-old union between Scotland and England? We're still faced with being taken out of the EU against our will. That's a democratic outrage, I think. It's not about whether there could be another independence referendum. Of course there could. It's about whether there should be one. This week, the Prime Minister will launch a process that will fundamentally change Britain's place in the world. It places Scotland in a special dilemma not faced by England and Wales. Nine months ago, just before the referendum on European Union membership, I made this observation. It seemed at the time hypothetical. Would a vote to leave the European Union propel Scotland further down the road to independence? Well, it certainly changes the independence proposition in ways we haven't even begun to consider yet. And it would confront Scotland with a new national question. Which union do you want to be part of, the British one or the European one? And that's an argument we haven't even started to have yet. It's not hypothetical now, it's real and urgent. So the UK appears to have voted out, Scotland has voted in. We voted to protect our place in the world's biggest single market and the jobs and investment that depend on it. What I am proposing cannot mean membership of the single market. We voted to safeguard our freedom to travel, live, work and study in other European countries. Brexit must mean control of the number of people who come to Britain from Europe. And that is what we will deliver. I want to take the opportunity this morning to speak directly to citizens of other European countries living here in Scotland. You remain welcome here. Scotland is your home and your contribution is valued. Last summer's EU referendum left the UK looking like two different countries, articulating two mutually hostile visions of the future. A second independence referendum, if and when it comes, will be fought on different terrain. How does Brexit change the independence prospectus? It makes it, in some ways, more likely that Scotland will become independent, but also more difficult. It does. I mean, th this time round, um, Nicola Sturgeon is very much linking uh, Scottish independence with EU membership. They're, they're inextricable here. That wasn't so much the case the first time round. You also have the problem uh, within the SNP that um, a good third of SNP members, uh, while they support independence, they also support uh, getting away from, from Brussels rule. So how does she square that off? Opinion polls suggest that some who voted no to independence in 2014 have moved into the yes camp because of Brexit. But what of that other group, those who want out of both unions? This is Lossiemouth on the Murray coast. Murray thrives by making whiskey and selling it across the world and by bringing in a free flow of tourists. In last year's EU referendum, Murray came closer than any other part of Scotland to voting leave. Why did it happen that Murray was the, the part of Scotland that came closest to voting for Brexit? I think it's an age demographic comes into it, and the military, in fact, comes into it quite a lot. We're very much a RAF, Air, uh, Navy and Army area, and that's left behind an awful lot of people that settled here. Uh, they're very pro the union. The SNP have actually made this assumption that uh, Anybody that actually votes for independence, you know, will automatically want to remain in Europe. Uh, but it's just not true. 
you know, they're, they're, uh, most of them are actually wanting to get out of Europe. And it's something that I learned, in fact, when I was an SNP candidate. I hadn't appreciated it until then, but about four years ago. Why do so many people here want to leave both the British Union and the European Union? It's, it's a curious one, isn't it? Uh, I think basically it's the SNP supporters, they're really staunch ones in this area. They're, they're really passionate about getting out. But the bottom line is, you know, I think when it comes right down to it, they really want independence. They're fiercely independent. So a lot of them want independence. They just don't want it in Europe. A few miles to the east, the Spey empties into the sea. This is the Scotland of the tourist brochure, of the international imagination. The river feeds two of the country's greatest industries, whiskey and tourism. The mainstream currents of Scottish public opinion contain many unexpected eddies. Murray, for example, is happy to send MPs from the SNP to both Westminster and Holyrood, but in 2014 it voted no to independence. And a substantial minority of the 45% who voted yes to independence went on two years later to vote to leave the European Union. A second independence referendum offering independence in Europe would present that group those who wanted independence for Scotland, but to leave the EU with a new dilemma and a new choice. Which union do you want to leave more? The British one or the European one? Whether you're for EU membership or against EU membership, I think something that unites many people is that these are decisions that shouldn't be imposed on us. These are decisions that we should take for ourselves. You know, if you think about it, in 2014, the No campaign said to Scotland, vote no to protect our place in the European Union. In 2016, uh, the UK government said, vote remain to protect our place in the European Union. Scotland did both of those things. And yet we're still faced with being taken out of the EU against our will. That's a democratic outrage, I think. And that's the argument that I think, whether you're for or against the EU, resonates with a lot of people. How does that appeal to democratic outrage measure up against economic anxiety? Murray is not a wealthy area, margins are tight, many incomes low. And Brexit raises questions for all of us about the viability of the companies we work for and the jobs that sustain us. Scotland's First Minister will have to appeal to a public for whom there is already too much uncertainty. Europeans make up um, sometimes up to 90% of our business in June, July, August, September. And what's very important is these people still feel welcome in Scotland. How much do you depend on migrant labour to run this place? In, in a normal seasons, it's made up 50% of our staff. 40% is quite normal, but I know hotels in, in um, London where it makes up 100% of staff. And that, that's going to give us real, real issues. Now, it's not as if this is... Um, an, a new problem for our industry because it's, we've had Im immigrants either from the Commonwealth or from Europe f for as long as I know. But what we do need to know, and we need to know fast, is where our future workforce is going to come from. In Britain there's a million people, roughly, employed in our hospitality industry. Unemployed is roughly 800,000 people. So we're immediately, if you could get all 800,000 people to move into our industry, we're immediately 200,000 people short. Trade changes. This is the railway station where grain once arrived at the Tam Du distillery and left years later as whiskey bound for markets around the world. It's a museum piece now, but the distillery remains. The industry is one of Scotland's great global success stories and Brexit is unlikely to change that. The rest of Scotland's food and drink industry cannot be that confident. This is an industry that is now bigger in Scotland's economy than oil and gas. This factory in West Lothian makes shortbread, another distinctively Scottish product. More of it comes off this production line in a day than any of us could eat in our lifetimes. It bakes in this volume, generates this level of business because it's free to sell across Europe. 
Will those markets still be open after Brexit? No one knows. 80% of all the food we sell out of Scotland into international markets goes to Europe. Europe is the ball game for our export story just now. So we're hugely reliant. A quarter goes to France alone. So ongoing access to that market is going to be critical if we're going to grasp opportunities for growth over the next few years. And how much of a threat does Brexit represent, presumably after Brexit, that people who are buying Scottish products and products will continue to want to buy them? Yeah, so I don't think demand will be our problem. Scotland has got an increasing reputation as a land of food and drink for producing quality products. But there's real fears around what Brexit means. There's huge unknowns. Owns. But if we lurch into a world where there might be huge export taxes put on our products, we could be, become uncompetitive very quickly. After the Brexit vote, the Scottish government formally asked the UK to try to negotiate a separate deal for Scotland, one that would keep Scotland inside the single European market. The leader of Scotland's Conservatives says that's just not possible. Well, it's, it's not about what I think, it's about what 27 other nations uh, around the negotiating table think, and they've said quite firmly no. So we've had the foreign minister for Spain come out and, and give it a flat no. We've had the president of France come out. We've had, you know, other European leaders saying that, that I'm sorry, that's just not on the cards. We negotiate with the UK as a whole. We don't negotiate with different bits of the, the member state. We don't uh, suggest that that will be straightforward or without legal, technical, political complexities, but we set out what those complexities would be and the basis on which they could be overcome. So within that, there's a significant concession. We accept very reluctantly that that proposal would see Scotland leave the European Union with the rest of the UK, uh, but that it would enable us to remain within the world's biggest trading market, which I think is important for our economy and for many other reasons too. Scotland, Britain as a whole, has not always been so dependent on European markets. We chose a European destiny in the early 1970s. Before that, for generations, we had, for the most part, bought from and sold to the British Empire. And the Empire, that shared Anglo-Scottish enterprise, bound Scotland securely into the United Kingdom. Scotland was an enthusiastic partner in the building of Imperial Britain, and Imperial Britain faced emphatically west, out into the world with its back turned to the European continent. This stretch of water, the River Clyde, became Scotland's trading superhighway to the prosperity of the planet. Glasgow became the second city of the empire, its wealth built first on trade and later on industry. And then in 1973, that all changed. Britain turned to face east, placing its back to the old empire. And this place started going into steep decline. No more heavy industry, eventually no more shipbuilding, no more ships from India and South Africa and Malaya coming up the Clyde laden with produce. And the anger and poverty and despair that that decline brought with it placed enormous strain on Scotland's union with England. It was the social context within which support for Scottish independence grew to its present level. Are we going to go through dramatic change of that sort again as a result of leaving the European Union? And what will it do to the union with England? The position of the union was it's probably at its strongest for obvious reasons immediately after and during World War II. But also because in the 50s, apart from Labour, there was also Conservative governments who were strongly sensitive and very much aware of ensuring that there was no sense of Westminster imperialism. That came to an end and there was a series of impositions, um, uh, uncritically un insensitive impositions, delivered at a time when the nation itself was going through economic crisis through indu the industrialisation. And we know what happened then. people say that we're not a Scottish party, but neither are we an English party, nor a Welsh party, nor an Irish party. We're a party of the whole United Kingdom. Since then, the union has been uh, at least semi-destabilised in most of the period since the 80s. Westminster, at least in relation to the opportunities for flexibility, in relation to what Edinburgh seems to want, as far as negotiations are concerned, has been implacably opposed. Um, in fact, the attitudes remind me very much of the inflexibility shown, uh, not by the Scottish office, 
but by Westminster politicians during the Thatcher era of, of, the, of the 1980s. What happens if that inflexibility does now break the Union? If Scotland stayed in the EU while the rest of the UK left, this border would become the edge not just of Scotland, but of a single trading bloc stretching to the Black Sea. This was not the proposition in 2014. This is something quite new, the possibility that a hard customs border might be drawn across the island of Britain. For Scotland, that's still a hypothetical question, but for Ireland, it's very real. This road bridge crosses the border between the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland. It's one of more than 200 places where you can make the crossing, and it really is an invisible border. You can drive across here without even noticing that you've left one country and entered another. After Britain leaves the European Union, it will still be legal for citizens of 26 other European countries to come here to the Republic of Ireland and get a job and claim benefits and use the public services. But if they walk a few yards in that direction into the United Kingdom, there'll be no automatic right to do any of that. That change is what Northern Ireland's biggest party, the Democratic Unionists, campaigned for. Why did the DUP back Brexit? Well, there's a number of reasons. The uh, European Union was very good at creating regulations. In fact, on agriculture, for example, it created 2,800 different regulations. And ultimately, uh, we believe that power is better vested uh, at the local level. So uh, we want more power to local authorities, uh, to regional assemblies, and ultimately to Westminster, not to be vested into Europe where we have little accountability. Do you accept that Britain's decision to leave the EU causes huge problems? for the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic? Oh, it does, yes. What uh, sort of problems? Well, do we have a hard border, do we have a soft border? Um, you know, Britain and, and, and Ireland have both indicated that they want to have um, a fairly open, free-flowing border. Now, the truth is, uh, we had something like 16,000 troops here, uh, 12,000 police officers, and many roads closed, and it didn't stop things getting across the border. So uh, I can't see that they will be able to enforce a hard border with uh, two or three hundred customs officers. The Nationalist SDLP are fiercely pro-European. Like the Scottish Government, they want the UK to negotiate a special status for Northern Ireland that would keep it inside the single market and keep the border open. For years we have spent time getting rid of the border, making sure that people could freely move and do business across the island and that people could integrate. And the Good Friday Agreement understood that both the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland were members of the European Union and we had an ability as Irish nationalists to further integrate in that context. Um, so taking all that away against our wishes is uh, very, very damaging to our political progress and to our uh, economic progress. What is the special status for Northern Ireland that you want to secure in Europe? What does it look like? Well, it looks like uh, very much what we have now, whether or not we remain as members of the European Union. Uh, it doesn't need to, to be that way. I think we can have the four freedoms across the island of Ireland and into uh, the European Union. We can do business, we can move. Uh, we don't have to try and harden that border. In fact, it isn't possible. Uh, there are about 260 border crossings from the north to the south. The idea that you could harden that border and control it in some way, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I believe that the problems that we will face will be much less than the problems the Republic of Ireland will face as a result of the Brexit, Brexit vote. And I think that the Irish government will have a lot of difficulties to deal with not least uh, their largest, um, uh, the, the country that they export most to, uh, is outside of the European Union. The opening of the Irish border has been transformative. Twenty years ago, there were watchtowers and military checkpoints here. Yeah, you can't come down this way. No. The border town of Newry was sunk in poverty and unemployment. Partition, it would be fair to say, it devastated the economy of this area. Newry was a thriving port, midway between Belfast and Dublin. And that 
locational advantage with partition, Newry's location was a major disadvantage. It was tied up against a, a hard border. Um, our sister town across the border, Dundalk, was labelled El Paso. Um, the rural hinterland was stigmatised by the British media during the Troubles as bandit country. Little wonder no one wants a return to a hard border. London and Dublin both say cross-border trade should remain free. But how, when the UK might well be importing goods from around the world that contravene EU import rules, could you stop those goods moving illegally across this border and into the European single market? Again, no one knows. But if you live here, it is the most urgent question. I didn't sign up for this, this is not my day job, I'm not a politician, I don't want to be doing this, but I um, have grown up in this place and I've seen it at its worst and I've had the privilege of participating with others in its rebirth and I don't want to lose that. Membership of the European Union has also transformed the Irish Republic. Europe is at the heart of its national identity and has been key to normalising its once acrimonious relationship with the UK. Britain and Ireland joined the European Community on the same day in 1973. It is shared membership of that single European market that has made that border between them unimportant to the point of invisibility. In Dublin, there is widespread dismay at the prospect of new border controls and pessimism too. There cannot be other than a hard border. The question is how hard it is. Even the softest borders with Switzerland, with Norway, that are uh, around the European Union have a requirement for customs clearances, for uh, document checking, etc. So that will have to be at a minimum there. And that's going to be disruptive. Even if you have that going to take place in some magical way that British customs will be embedded in Irish ports, which I, I can't see politically, then that has a consequence. There will have to be additional costs imposed upon exporters from the north going through or to the south and vice versa. Whether or not this free movement of people is a, is a different issue. Um, free movement of people isn't free movement of work and free movement of work isn't free movement of goods. And all three have been somewhat conflated. Ireland's border question finds an echo in Scotland. For if, as London and Dublin both desire, a way is found to allow trade to continue freely across the border, wouldn't that set a precedent for an independent Scotland trading with a UK outside the EU? Are there parallels between Ireland and devolved Scotland and the, the, the predicament that uh, Brexit puts a devolved Scotland in? particularly having voted, voted overwhelmingly, to remain? I think there is. I think there's... And this is one of the tensions that's playing out in Ireland. There's an awareness growing that uh, a solution for Northern Ireland could also have ramifications in Scotland. So this idea is growing that if, if the border a border solution was found, could that then be a case that's used by an independent Scotland or, or an independ a pro-independence campaign in a future referendum to say, well, you did it for Northern Ireland, why can't you do it for us? We share a land border with you, why can't we come to that same solution? The border is one question, others remain. What currency would an independent Scotland use? How would it close the gap between what it spends and what it raises in taxation? for that gap is wide. And could it, should it, join the EU? This is the territory on which a second independence referendum would be fought. So I can confirm today that next week I will seek the authority of the Scottish Parliament to agree with the UK government the details of a Section 30 order, the procedure that will enable the Scottish Parliament to legislate for an independence referendum. I think just now we should be putting all our energies into ensuring that we get that right deal for the UK and the right deal for Scotland in our negotiations with the European Union. Uh, that's my job as Prime Minister. Right now we should be working together, not pulling apart. We should be working together to get that right deal for Scotland, that right deal for the UK. So I say that's my job 
as Prime Minister. And so for that reason, uh, I say to the SNP, now is not the time. Theresa May could stop another independence referendum in its tracks, really, by agreeing to try to negotiate a separate deal for Scotland. Why won't she do that? Well, I've never had uh, anybody within the SNP, and I've spent eight months trying to get them to tell me now, when they talk about a differentiated deal, why the only differentiation they recognise is one of geography. Um, why is it that somebody that works in a particular part of RBS in an office in Gogerburn needs something different out of the EU negotiation that somebody that works in the same part of RBS uh, in the same department but out of an office in London? Why is it that the fruit farmer in Perthshire needs something different in terms of a seasonal workers visa than the fruit farmer in Kent? I've asked repeatedly time and time again why the sectoral differentiation doesn't seem to apply but only geographic differentiation does and nobody in the SNP has been able to tell me. We know that you're doing some work on the, on the, the currency question. Mm. It's no longer an option, is it, to say we're but, going to share the pound sterling? Alan, I'm, I'm, not going to, I'm, not, I'm not being difficult here, although you will think I am being difficult. Uh, I, I'm not going to, to jump a few steps and get into detailed discussions just now. What I absolutely accept, and I've always accepted, if Scotland at any stage, whether it's uh, in the next couple of years or a time after that, is in another debate about its future in the context of an independence referendum, those of us who advocate independence have a duty to answer the questions that people need answers to. And, and that uh, includes uh, issues around economic uh, sustainability and security. It includes questions around the currency. It, in this context, will undoubtedly include questions about a relationship with the European Union. Uh, but, you know, firstly, we, we're in a process just now where I have judgments to make as the Prime Minister has judgments to make and I will make those in good order and based on what I think is best. So I'm not going to jump ahead several steps. When it comes to fighting for independence in a second referendum, will you be straight with the people and say, look, Scotland is going to inherit as an independent country a big deficit and there will be pain in the first few years. There will have to be spending cuts or tax increases or big borrowing or a combination of all three. Look, I will be very straight with people, I, I will always try to do that. Scotland right now, as part of the UK, has a big deficit and we're facing, we have had for the past five years, spending cuts. Brexit is undoubtedly going to make the UK's deficit worse. It's going to uh, possibly lead to greater spending cuts in the UK um, and greater pain as a result of that. So the question for Scotland is not, is not how do we escape uh, magically a deficit, it's how do we best equip ourselves to deal with that deficit and to grow our way into a more sustainable position uh, with our own values underpinning the decisions we take. That's the, the decision that would be in play if Scotland was making that choice again.